Hello, welcome to the Equity Institute's podcast on the purpose of public education with me, your host, Vincent Perez. Today, we'll be speaking with Annie Pocklington. Uh, I first met Annie in the Masters of Public Administration program that we were, to, we were in together at the Evergreen State College. Uh, she has since received her Doctor of Education, and I've always known her to have a real passion for young people connecting with students um, in beekeeping and in other service uh, projects. Please welcome Annie Pocklington. Annie, thank you so much for being here and taking time with us uh, on the podcast to, to consider what is the purpose of public education. So for our audience, could you please just tell us a little bit about who, who you are and your connection to public education? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, by the way. Um, always an honor to be invited into any space I get to share with you. So big thanks. Um, my name is Annie Pocklington. I grew up in Grays Harbor, Washington, um, in Hoquiam, actually, and moved to Olympia right before my junior year of high school, which feels really important to uh, how I understand public education, I think, is that shift in my own K-12 schooling. Did my undergrad at Washington State University and was a linked into student involvement there and loved working as like a student ambassador, someone in student orientation programs. And it kind of opened my eyes to this possibility of um, working in a professional space linked to education. I grew up actually in a family of teachers. So my grandma was a teacher, um, all my uncles on my dad's side. So my dad and all his siblings were teachers. My mom was a teacher um, and just retired last year from, or excuse me, two years ago from teaching to watch my niece full time. Um, so education has been very much around me my whole life. Um, naturally, as a resistant and rebellious daughter, I told my parents all growing up, I would never be a teacher. That was never going to happen. Um, and so naturally, I found myself in education in other ways. So now I work in the higher ed access realm, I would say. Higher ed access? Yeah. So um I work with a federal grant and we do a lot of um, exploratory work with students in the K-12 system around educational opportunities after high school. So I imagine part of that is thinking about readiness for this. Are they, are they ready you know, for that next step? Absolutely. Uh, so with that frame, especially coming from a family of educators, uh, what is the purpose of public education? Yeah. What, what a great question. Um, you know, naturally, as I kind of prepared for our conversation today, I just got, I just wrapped up a doctoral program um, and graduated in June, which was um, really, really a special time for me. And I definitely consider myself a student at heart, something I love to do to lean into learning spaces. And so when you asked, you know, thinking of public education, I'm like, I need to define that. I need to like, how am I going to wrap my head around what public education means just generally? And so I spent the day kind of mulling through some of the most impactful readings. And I just had to laugh um, because, you know, I'm a work in progress, right? Like many of us are. And um, I found this book. This book is called um, Decolonizing Methodologies. It's by Linda Tuahi Smith. Um, and it was incredibly impactful in my learning. Very many times she paused me in whatever like rapid thinking patterns I was in to throw me in a totally different direction. And so, you know, I'm mulling through all of my readings this morning and I came across this highlighted piece. Um, and it says, the language of space influences the way that the West thinks about the world beyond earth, cosmology, the ways in which society is viewed, public versus private space, city versus country space, and the ways in which gender roles are defined, public or domestic, home or work, and the ways in which the social world of people could be determined, the marketplace, the theater. Compartmentalized, space can be better defined and measured. Um, and I was just kind of chuckling at myself, right? Because I'm sitting here like, I need to define public space. And uh, Dr. Tawahi Smith is just like, or chill out about it, you know? Like, it doesn't need to have such strict perimeters. The West is getting to you, sister. So I was thinking, like, wow, public education could be so many things. Of course, naturally, what comes to mind is the K-12 setting and classrooms and um, banking education, uh, which I would define, just in case folks aren't aware of banking education, is kind of like 
the call and repeat methodology of many of systems education. It's the memorization spaces that we see, memorizing our multiplication tables, one true answer to any question that's asked, right? Um, so, so I think it's important to recognize that, that we commonly kind of come to that definition of public education as the K-12 space that's really familiar. Um, but I also think it's important for us to kind of expand our minds beyond those spaces as well. Um, I like to think that public education is offered to us through our communities in many ways. Um, I was even just thinking about uh, notions like AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Like this public space where folks can learn and reflect and lean into different things. So that's one of many examples, but something that kind of rose to surface for me today. And when I think about public education, what is public education? I think it's dynamic. Um, I don't want to talk about it in a way that is, you know, robs it of any value at all, right? Um, I think there's definitely value in public education. But I think we also have to come to the table willing to talk about public education as a space that is harmed and marginalized folks um, in many ways. I, I think that public education oftentimes is really thought of this space where truth is found or truth is taught, right? Um, I think hierarchy is present in public education the way we most commonly know it um, as teacher versus student kind of system, teacher versus administrator kind of system. Um, these spaces of hierarchy and, and different levels of power and access. Uh, I really quickly wanted to bring up this quote. I was also referencing an article that I co-wrote with one of my cohort, cohort members and a faculty within my program at UW-Tacoma. And it's called Selling, uh, Selling Graduation, Higher Education, and the Loaning of Liberation. And this quote I came across was by Tara Yoso. Um, and she talks about this contradictory nature of education, where schools most often oppress and marginalize while they maintain the pen potential to emancipate and empower. Um, so... I just, I, I hold that question so lightly because I want to be truthful and realistic about what public education has been without robbing it of its potential to be, I guess. Uh, so just kind of holding that really delicately as I, as I answer. I appreciate that uh, kind of expanded way of thinking. A couple of things come to mind. Uh, one, John Taylor Gatto writes uh, in, years ago, um, I'm going to forget the title of the books I read, but the idea of the library a free information for all, right? Really being one of the pillar institutions of this country um, and public parks, right? What kind of education is occurring just in that natural space? Mm. And as you talk about the harm and Yoso, I lean into Yoso a lot for community cultural wealth. I've taught students this. I give it directly to them, to educators, just did it a few days ago with the school district because it's an asset-based framework that taps into right all those forms of cultural capital that all students already come in with, especially the marginalized, you know, the aspirational, the linguistic, uh, the resistant capital. So I really appreciate you exploring that in this conversation. I posit that ultimately when I think about when I even the term I use public ed, right, it's it's law. I mean, it's policy. It's yeah. compulsory education, right? Um, so when we graduate at its best, it's going to foster stable human beings. Mm -hmm. and I, then the next question is, well, what knowledge, skills and attributes do we need to be stable? And I don't know if you've been watching um, Reservation Dogs or anything. It's this I highly, highly recommend it's on Hulu. I'm not usually a TV person. I don't watch a lot of it, but it's all native produced and and written and created. So they really look at uh, Indian boarding schools in this in this yeah. season here. And a few weeks ago, an episode just pierced my my soul. Like I'm weeping for a couple weeks later, just in the thinking of it, and to say this is actual. This is what school is. And I've gotten to share about um, my sister who had passed away some years ago. And while the family was gathering, I was at the computer writing her obituary. And there's my sister, my brother, and my mom, and all of our kids and my sister's children. And the first paragraph we write is to thank a teacher, Mrs. Leah. Mm -hmm. She was blind. And so Miss Leah gave her access to the world. She taught her how to write Braille. She taught her how to use their cane. So really, that's also public education. Yeah. Right? So to me, to as you name, to hold these polar realities because when i say to students it should be a, a place to foster stability they're like this is the place that's doing harm mm, so yeah. and for some it's a place of healing 
right? And often where it's connection to a, an adult who, who they could trust and, and all those things we know. So with, with that frame, um, can I jump in one more thing really quick? Please. You know, the other thing as I was preparing for today, um, and again, figuring out myself through this, right? And that journey of learning that is just self. I was also reflecting on the fact that education to me and that banking system of education, um, growing up, I was never a memorizer. Like that skill was not something that worked for me. And to this day, um, it's not something that works for me. In fact, I would classify myself as someone like that doesn't have the best memory. I'm kind of the type of person who's like, Hey, remember when we were X, Y, or Z, can you like, you know, recall some of the details? And, um, I come into this conversation, right. With like this stack of books, um, not just because, these are incredible voices, but because I don't want my limitation on memorizing things to be something that qualifies me as intelligent or worthy of conversation, et cetera, et cetera. And I think so many of our students are in that place of whether it's memorization or not, the modalities that we learn or that we utilize in learning spaces, if they don't work for a student, you know, what does that do to the narrative they're telling themselves about learning and what it means to be a student? Um, and so for me, you know, I might lean on this stack of books as we move through because things have hit me in such powerful ways. And I know they're a part of the way that I understand the world, but recalling uh, specific words or authors, et cetera, et cetera, by memorization, I've let go of holding myself to that standard because I think it's really um just drug me down in the past to, to tell myself that to be a successful learner or student, I need to have the skill of memorization. So I just, I just wanted to name that um, because I'm recognizing it in my own adult learning process of like letting that go and leaning into um, intelligence and engagement, just looking different person to person. So then with, with that stack, <laughs> yeah, please. I'm, I'm curious about the solutions of mm -hmm. other approaches, models, frameworks, theories um, that have worked particularly well in your understanding. And especially as you see students access higher ed. So if they're leaving K-12, what have you seen really, really working for students? The first thing that comes to mind is without a doubt relationship, right? I mean, I think that if you're a human that exists in the world, um, and especially a human who's experienced any sort of maybe classically defined success or systemically defined success, R relationships are so key to how that pans out for many people um, and students. I just, I feel like what students need are um, adults, friends, peers who have some experience, who believe in them, can lean into vulnerability and not knowing um, as spaces of comfort and um, yeah, I think relationships are, are so, so important, um, to the way that we learn and experience education and move and move forward in our education. You know, you talked about your sister and that teacher, and it makes me think of Bettina Love and her talking about the education survival complex. Um, and if I might reach to my stack of books again here, I just wanted to read this piece by her because it was so um, powerful to me and kind of speaks to what you're talking with Reservoir Dogs. Native American boarding schools, school segregation, English only instruction, Brown versus board, no child left behind, school choice, charter schools, charter education, race to the top, all have been components of an educational system built on the suffering of students of color. I call this the educational survival complex in which students are left learning to merely survive, learning how schools mimic the world they live in thus making schools a training site for a life of exhaustion. I think that is so true. And what I know about Bettina Love is that she was a teacher in a classroom. And to think about someone like Bettina Love at the front of a classroom, um, being this pillar of hope for students, right? It, it again plays into that dynamic nature of the educational system. There's so much hurt, but I have to believe there's just so much hope as well. Um, and I think so much of that hinges on the relationships that we have access to within those spaces. And that, of course, you know, plays into me that next part is community, right? Relationships 
I think of as a one-to-one situation Mm -hmm. oftentimes, but then there's this community piece. Um, A lot of my work revolves around peer mentorship and it's incredible to see how students engage differently with their peers than with adults. Um, It's hard to dissolve the hierarchy of relationships. It, It really is. An adult to student can absolutely work, but I also feel like there's just power and similarity and power and finding community and someone that looks and experiences things like you. And um, yeah, relationship and community are just so important. I also think about in terms of what I've experienced working, I look at my doctoral program. um, And for anyone listening who is interested in pursuing a doctorate in educational leadership. I don't have enough amazing things to say about the University of Washington Tacoma's program. Incredibly um, well-led program. They're they're actually in a search for a new leader currently, um, but the folks leading that search are, are people that I absolutely trust. Um, but also just incredible values instilled in what the program offerings are. The course offerings are incredible. Um, the folks that they employ um, as professors, yeah, are just top notch. Um, And so one of the pieces of completing our dissertations, of course, it wasn't a requirement, but I would say like a strong suggestion that came after, you know, years of uh, the foundational coursework that led us to our dissertation is this idea that um, research is something that you do on your own community. Research is something that's going to be most impactful when you aren't an outsider looking in, but you're an insider experiencing alongside others. Um, And I ended up looking at the relational impacts on women with student loan debt. And the amazing thing about my dissertation was that it was this massive culmination of all my learning, right? And I was so worried about this writing process. And I'm not going to say that the writing process wasn't challenging, um, but my findings were so easy to write because I interviewed six women who I was in a deep friendship with. They were, they were friends of mine. Um, and the ability to engage in conversation and learning with them was seamless because that's what we do in relationship. We learn through our own experiences alongside the experiences of other people. Um, so to be able to engage in research that was relational was incredible. Um, and so I feel like it's also important for us to just understand that we learn better when we trust the folks we're learning alongside and with. Um, and also, I think when we dissolve this hierarchical hierarchical notion of what education is, um, I think about pedagogy versus andragogy and, you know, pedagogy being the way that children learn and andragogy being the way that adults learn. And I think pedagogy in the U.S. educational system spans far too long. Um so viewing students as children or people who aren't in, engaged or responsible or motivated for their own learning. Um, yeah, I, I wrestle with when pedagogy is a correct modality. Um, so just inviting students into their own learning and engaging with them um, feels like an important piece an important educational philosophy as well is to just engage the learner in what they want to learn. For, for years, I've told students about, um, you know, when we're old enough. So we think of all of human history, when is adulthood come? Mm-hmm. And our education system has extended childhood, if you will, right? Yes. We don't have responsibilities until graduation, typically 18, but we become adults biologically through puberty. Mm-hmm. And so just like any adult in any other mammal, you know, the deer or, or, lion or you know in in much of human history that was honored there was ritual there was uh, something to note and say hey you are shifting now and um the the capacity for uh is was 100 so i i tell students imagine all 18 year olds and older were just wiped out for some reason could you sustain the culture could you keep food in the grocery store could you keep the stock market going right now you're not given the skills or the tools to do that but could you do you have the capacity yes you do because throughout all of human history you would have 100 sustainable value by the time you're 17 mm-hmm. right you would know 
what skills, how to get food, you know, all the basic human needs and shelter and relation and ceremony. And we would continue the culture because our, you were acknowledged and you were um, often given new names and such. So when students hear that, you know, at 16, 17, 18, and they, they feel robbed. And so how do we honor the students at this age? Because if you could procreate, you're an adult. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's just what it means, right? And so um, it was very curious to me. The other piece is around near peer mentor that you mentioned. So I don't serve middle school students without having high school students. Mm -hmm. I don't serve high school students without having college students. Mm -hmm. That near peer mentor, I'm wondering about how to do more of that in our systems, right? Yeah. CTE courses for high school students to come back to the elementary and middle school and, and teach the little ones. In our natural world, I don't know if you come from a large family, but when I think about my my children with their cousins, the older are always taking care of the, the littles. It's just what is naturally happening. So how do we right. to say all students and learn the same thing at the exact same age, you know, it's not really very human. Right, right. So, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I think the amazing thing about this idea of here, I was talking with a colleague the other day and we were like wrestling with this notion of peer, right? Like, what does it mean to be a peer? I think oftentimes when we hear peer, we, or at least I, often go to like age grouping, right? But I think, again, we have this incredible possibility to expand our notion of peer. And certainly it could be age. Like when we think about maybe college access, right? Like the near peer piece of a freshman in college and a senior in high school is, is really important in that transition stage, right? At the same time, a peer can simply be someone we share interests with. So you talk about CTE, why a seventh grader and a sophomore finishing yeah. up at in a CTE program couldn't be peers, you know, to limit ourselves to just age, right? Um, yeah, so I love I love that thinking around giving opportunity for us to collaborate with other people who are like us, um, share interests with us have maybe the same value system as us. Um, yeah, there's a lot of cool opportunity there. I mean, that's what we do in adult relationships, right? Or in the professional world. In the workplace, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I'm constantly seeking out folks. Um, you know, you and I staying connected. How wonderful to meet at a certain space and time and be able to call on each other because we share this set of values or understandings about certain things. Um it's a, it's a life skill to do that, to be in relationship to people and to be a self-advocate, right? To ask for what we need. There's a whole skill set there. Yeah, absolutely. That's like all the dreaming, <laughs> all the places yeah. we want to get to. Yes. Um, I'm curious when we think about, you know, managing the challenges that we face, um, what do you think are the most significant obstacles in achieving, right, this, what I'm finding is a theme of humanizing education, A. Eh? Mm. That's, that's kind of what I'm hearing in you. We have to be honored yep. Whole person, yeah. Um, and there's pieces out there, right? I actually, you're in Tacoma. That that um, the whole child, right? I mean, these are mm -hmm. these are initiatives and movements, and they're they've been happening, right? This is not right. a new concept. Um, but I'm curious, how do you see overcoming the, what naming the challenges and then overcoming them? The first thought that comes to mind for me is just systems, right? We had a good friend go through a mental health crisis a few weeks ago, and watching the system of care fail him because his situation, you know, I mean, systems are built for everybody to go through a similar pathway, right? And we know education is that way too. Like I said, like I'm not banking, education doesn't work for me. So systems first and foremost are a huge barrier for us. I also think that um, folks have been harmed by systems and it's hard to re-engage people who have felt harmed, lied to, like they can't trust. Um, when I work with younger students, I've often heard things about older, you know, like you said, you're talking about this near peer thing. I've heard things about older brother, sister, cousin, aunt, and the harm that they experienced opting into, you know, whether it be financial aid or college pathways. Um Harm isn't easily erased once it's done. So rebuilding trust um, is definitely something that needs to happen. Paulo Freire talks about, um, he talked about this submerging of the way that we're submerged in systems and cultures. We just 
it's, it's so much work to call to the forefront, um, these new ideas and changes. It's just easy to get lost in the systems unless we're kind of banded together with folks, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, he says the more students work at storing the deposits entrusted to them, the less they develop the critical consciousness, which would result from their intervention in the world of transformers of that world. Um, so, engaging students in this new system and structure with them kind of as the lead, the lead, the driving force, right? Um, I think that we have to be able to call students into that. And that's potentially a challenge, again, given that harm, but also we all just know these systems so well, just like me preparing for this conversation today and wanting to come with the right answers, right? I mean, gosh, we are all deep in that deep in that um like a training right we're all trained pretty like right. with compliance, compliance right training. absolutely and our students are there and you know i think um and, and again i want to be gentle in saying this because i don't have experience as a teacher um but based on my own experience as a student i think our teachers are there as well you know it's hard to give up grading systems it's hard to give up um, truancy. It's hard to give up these notions that we've so deeply embedded in what educational systems look like and what success in those systems look like. So there's just so much unlearning that needs to happen around educational systems and so much relearning that needs to happen. Um, and I love the, I, I love the notion of like unlearning and real and, and relearning. It has to be cyclical, right? Because um, again, like showing up to this today and recognizing some space for me to unlearn like I don't have to have the right answer I can say something and it can be wrong like I can you know text you next week and say like I actually changed my mind about something you know um I feel like in the U.S. and maybe just globally but especially in the U.S. where this notion of independence and self as main character it's so hard to be vulnerable we struggle so much to say, I don't know. Um, and I think one of the greatest strengths in kind of reimagining the world around us could be finding liberation and not knowing things, finding liberation and there not being a single truth. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, we kind of started this conversation talking about public education is this system of banking education where a question is asked and an answer is given um, gosh, I wish we could just rejoice in like conversation, um, or mutual reciprocal learning. Yeah. To just give up the hierarchy and the one truth, one size fits all. Uh, I would love to go back through K-12 and do it like that. You know, so I'm, I'm hearing some themes. I'm hearing like pluralism, unlearning mm. and repair, right. Yes. And, and reconciliation, all those renewal to me, there's a whole piece, um, that's entirely missing around yes. I mean, we get, we're getting some sense of restorative practice this kind of the way it's delivered or restorative justice has its limitations to me as well so totally but the i the the need for repair and reconnection i'm um, certainly there mm -hmm. what a great conversation mm -hmm. so i'm curious uh as we close and is especially being in a home of educators while you're going through k-12 um how did your schooling impact you and you mentioned Dr. Love. There's a uh, some of her thinking that I, you know, when she writes about spirit murder, mm. schools crush some of us. Mm. Um, like, what did it do for your spirit? What did it do for your, your like your psyche, like your core, you know, well being? So, yeah, take it. I'm just curious what. Yeah, so dynamic. Um, in some ways, my identity my identity offered me this free pass through K-12, right? Um, you know, and I'm talking class and the color of my skin, but I'm also talking parents as teachers, right? Um, in another sense, you know, it's so funny, while banking education doesn't work for me, my brother is like the king of all factoids. Um, you know, he is just someone who thrives in like the factoid style learning and having an older brother that was that way 
Um, I think in a lot of ways, I compared myself at home to him. And in my eyes, um, I'd be curious to ask him this question, but learning kind of came easy to him in that way, where I really had to work to learn. Um, And at the same time, I think I met or exceeded standards as I moved through K-12. And so education was an affirming space for me. Was that how smart I was? Or was that my identity? Like, I don't know. That's really hard to untangle now. Um, What I do know is that um, education was and is a space I continue to find myself in because learning feels, it's just like a really fulfilling thing for me. I find joy in it naturally, I think. What I know now is um, it doesn't have to happen in that classroom setting. Um, you know, just like those research interviews I was talking about with my girlfriends, like give me a charcuterie board and a glass of wine and (laughs) a few good friends. And like, I'm, I'm in my deepest space of learning, um, navigating life with a partner. I feel like we learned so much. We just grieved our best boy, Charlie, our cat, um, two weeks ago. And I was just in awe, like sitting in grief with my partner and being like, wow, like I am learning about myself and I'm learning about you in these like tremendously hard moments. Right. Um, so the more we humanize education too, like none of us come to these systems as like little pegs, you know, with the same history experience, whatever we have hard days, good days, education can be a space of joy. You know, maybe some of us do show up with this confidence and being vulnerable. Um, I think sometimes that can be a strength for me is like, I'm actually, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable not knowing, like I'm pretty comfortable, um, admitting maybe that I messed up or didn't know stuff. I know other folks who like, that's a really hard space for them to get to. So I love school. I mean, clearly I just got my doctorate and and what I tell everybody (laughs) about like getting a doctorate is like, I promise, I absolutely promise it has nothing to do with how smart anyone is. Um, I know this to be absolutely true because I just finished up a dissertation and graduated, right? And what I do know is moving through the systems, like this kind of conclusion I've come to is as you go up, it's less about how smart you are and more about how much time you're willing to give over to the learning process that works for you. And again, I think things vary there. Number one, how much time do people have? Um, number two, we all learn differently. So even that, like there, you know, no one has the same time frame when it comes to learning or doing things. So yeah, my answer feels winded and dynamic, like each of these other questions. It's just so tied up in who and how we are. And um, yeah, I feel like I couldn't possibly untangle my experience in the K-12 system from my born identity. I just, I can't. So, so grateful for your time. Um, Is there any other message that when we think about public education that maybe, you know, we didn't cover here that you want to be sure our our audience considers? Gosh, I don't think so. I mean, I think I would maybe just reiterate something that has felt more and more important to me as I figure out myself and the world around me, which is just like, let's not confine education. Um, We shouldn't confine it to spaces. We shouldn't confine it to people or positions. Um, we certainly shouldn't confine it to history. And when I say that, like the way things have been done, like we can dream to new spaces and places. Um, in fact, I think it's our responsibility to do so. Um, when I think about history, I often think about, this is so ridiculous. And I've like used this metaphor with other people. So if anyone's ever heard me say this before, my apologies. I interviewed my grandma a few years ago Um just to have some of her life stored somewhere. Um, And yeah, and to be in conversation with her, right? And this funny thing came up around food. And she was talking about how all my grandkids talk about quinoa. And I didn't know what quinoa was until like a year ago, right? And so I kind of just had this like weird epiphany with food. 
And it made me think about the fact, like, you know, in the fifties, meatloaf and a can of whatever, something green was like the stereotypical healthy family dinner. We've moved beyond that. And we've got to move to new spaces and education too. We've got to move past the meatloaf and potatoes, right? <laughs> onto new ventures, likely that take into consideration dietary needs, right? Um, preferences, access, like we're ready to move to new things. And it doesn't, I mean, it's going to be scary, right? I think the reason that we exist in these spaces of banking education is because what feels safest to us is often what's known. Um, but if we can move beyond that, there's just a world of infinite possibility. And it's time we move to the spaces that we have thought were impossible, right? It's time for us to get there. So I'm super hopeful for the future of education. Um, super excited to be a colleague and partner with you in educational spaces. Absolutely. So thank you so much for having me. It's been a joy. Um, I'm sure we'll have many more conversations similar to this. I hope the next time we do that, yeah, we're dreaming up bigger things. So thank you. Thank you. And congratulations on your doctorate. Thanks. I appreciate it. I do.